delighted to uh, to have as uh, as the moderator of the next of this next session uh, James Fellows, who is uh, is the uh, national correspondent for the Atlantic. He's one of the one of the nation's best known journalists and writers, and has been so for several decades. He's worked uh, for the Atlantic uh, for more than 25 years in Washington, D.C., Seattle, Berkeley, Austin, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Shanghai, and most recently in Beijing. He was raised in Redlands, California, received his undergraduate degree in American history and literature from Harvard, and received a graduate degree in economics from Oxford. He, uh, in addition to uh, working for the Atlantic, he was the chief um, uh, speechwriter for Jimmy Carter, uh, he's also spent two years as the uh, editor of U.S. News and World Report and six months as a program designer at Microsoft. Uh, his two most recent books, uh, Blind into Baghdad and Postcards from Tomorrow Square, uh, are based on his writings uh, for the Atlantic. Jim? Thanks so much for this great introduction. Thank you all. I'll show you how to do it. Okay. So how about that? Yep. Yep. So th thanks for the gracious introduction. Thank you all for coming here. We're all delighted to have Senator Mark Warner here to answer some questions. I'm going to ask him some first, and after a while, I'll turn it over to the uh, to all of you. As you all know, uh, Senator Warner has been a senator from Virginia since the 2008 election. Before that, he was an extremely successful governor of Virginia. He converted a deficit into a surplus. He had bipartisan success. He was chairman of the National Governors Association. He left office on an up as opposed to leaving on a down, as many do. And before that, of course, he had two decades as a very successful high-tech executive. Uh, he also, uh, relevant to this year's campaign, like President Obama, like Governor Romney, is a graduate of the Harvard Law School. So we will reflect, reflect upon that. Um, Senator Warner, although entirely capable of holding any stage on his own, was originally going to be uh, paired with a Republican Senator Moran of, of Kansas, who has not been able to join us uh, for, for Senate business this morning. And that actually is a somewhat piquant note, because we're going to be talking about bipartisanship as it deals with, uh, with, with tech policy and long-term investment in, in America's uh, future. It is accidental rather than intentional that we have only a monopartisan presence here, but in a way it, it does make it um, possible to ask about, about those elements. So I'm going to ask Senator Warner to talk about the things he has done successfully and where he's run into obstacles, how he thinks that people who care about this cause for America's future can, can present their, their, their arguments. And then after we've done that for a while, again, I'll invite all of you to join. Senator has an engagement on Capitol Hill. A senator's day makes any of the rest of us feel relaxed when we know what they, they have to do. So we will uh, stop for sure at 12 noon so we can make his next appointment. We're very delighted that he is, is here. The, the, and I'll just say one other thing, that with uh, the Senator's service on the what, rules and commerce and banking, and which one am I forgetting? Intel. And the Intel Committee, he's uh, really well positioned to talk about the intersection among technology and the economy and politics and bipartisanship. So we, we are, uh, we're very fortunate to have him here. Plus, he is an honorary co-chair of ITIF. The role in which, for which he is best known in this uh, these precincts. Let me start with this argument or this question. Everybody in this room knows the arguments about the importance of long-term investment in technology policy for the U.S. and our education system and R and D and all the rest. We know these arguments. What have you figured out about why these arguments engage or don't with the American public and with the other party? And is there any new way to present them that you found, either as governor or as senator, that sort of breaks through the wall of indifference or opposition or whatever? How can this argument most successfully be made? Be made? Well, first of all, Jim, thank you for the introduction. I, I do feel a, <clears throat> uh, a little You went through this nice introduction of me, <laughs> talked about all the things as a business guy and as a governor. 
And then he said, he's been Senator for a while. <laughs> Which maybe, you know, I think partially is an indication of maybe what I've done or not done, but also a little bit of the kind of indictment of, of why Congress has got a 90% disapproval rating at this point. Uh, and I'm part of the 90% in terms of uh, where I side on which side of the, the table on this issue. Um, you know, it is enormously frustrating uh, that uh, you know, there seems to be a consensus in this town that we get to take presidential election years off. Um, I'm not sure the Brazilians or the Chinese or the Indians all had got that memo uh, and puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, I am, and let me emphasize again a couple of open comments. One that, you know, I am um, reflexively bipartisan. And, and Jerry Moran has been a great partner on this issue, just as Bob Corker was on financial reform and in the area that I'm most obsessed about, uh, debt and deficit reduction, Saxby Chambliss, and, and Tom Coburn, and uh, Mike Crapo, and, and many, many others. Um, and part of the reason why I'm kind of reflexively bipartisan is both kind of as a business guy, you, the way you measure success is by what you actually got done. Politics may be the only business where you can have a career and do nothing more than point out what's wrong with the other guys and that be viewed as a successful outcome. Uh, but secondarily, uh, I think it what I don't think the American public has quite honestly, trust in either political party in terms of turning the keys over to them. And there's nothing that intellectually makes a a, um, a bipartisan argument better other than the fact that I think it serves as a quasi-code to most Americans that if it's bipartisan, maybe it's actually got the country's interest in, in place. And I think it is, again, something that is so necessary and, uh, at some point during this conversation today, you're going to have to at least hear a short riff on deaf and deficit and how that affects everything around innovation. I, I promise I won't start with that. <laughs> how do we how do we do um, a better job of making the argument around innovation? I, I, I honestly felt like I was perhaps better able to do this um, as governor, uh, where you can directly tie it more to economic development, and there was more to job creation, and there was more to you know, activities at, at the um, specific university level. I think it is under, uh, we are under assault um, on making the case for innovation at the national level and have, have done, um, we all say it, but we're pretty lame at then translating that into specifics. And again, before I get into the specifics of that, why I believe that, let me again give a, a shout out to Rob Atkinson, I don't, See in the room right now, but uh, back and back. But Rob and ITIF, it's a, it is a, a great organization that has been about this subject for some time. Um, and part of the reason why I feel like we have have not done a great job around advocacy for innovation. I think in the '90s, uh, innovation was cool. In the '90s. Uh, we saw the tangible results of innovation, an explosion of companies, an explosion of growth, and an economy that was driven by innovation. Uh, I think we've all seen in the last few years that you know the, the data from Kaufman that shows that 80% of all the new jobs are created by startup companies, which are all directly related to innovation and the kind of creative capitalism that comes out of that. Um, most of us on the political side still talk about the growth engine being small businesses. It's candidly not it is startup companies. It is those innovative, creative destructors that um, um, has has caused that job growth. And you know, it's not the traditional barbershop or hardware store. Part of the reason why I think innovation has not had as good a name during the first decade of the, the 20th century is uh, two or threefold. One was in the excess of the 90s. Um, we created uh, perhaps a too easy a path uh, to access the public markets, uh, and there was the heyday of early stage venture and angel networks, and you weren't cool unless you were dealing with a startup. And that came to a pretty much a grinding halt in the end of the 90s with the passage of Sarbanes Oxley, but it had good things and lots of good things. 
it came with the transition in my old industry, the venture capital business, where there was so much money flowing into venture capital that the better firms moved up the food chain and did less and less early stage uh, A round and angel round. And after the collapse of the, the dot-com bubble, a lot of the pseudo new multimillionaires and billionaires didn't have any deal anymore, and, and the angel networks disappeared. Point one. Point two, the result of that is well made that the exit vehicle for most innovative companies was no longer the public markets, and there were exceptions, but it was selling to larger companies. And with due respect to seeing some of you around the room and the companies you represent, you know, I believe the adage that, you know, where do good ideas go to die is when they, good ideas are acquired by traditional Fortune 500 companies, and nine times out of ten, that great innovation spirit is lost. Point three, uh, I think that, unfortunately, in the, the first decade of, of, of this century, um, <clears throat> innovation, where innovation was taking place, and there are exceptions, particularly in the social media area, around things like Facebook and Twitter at all, but where the vast amount of innovation went, where the brightest minds went, where the smartest innovation was taking place, was not in telecom or energy or life sciences, it was in financial innovation. And the best and the brightest went to Wall Street to create new financial products that we were all promised were going to lower the price of risk and instead create a fiscal house of cards that almost collapsed the whole economy. And fourth, um, I, have, I have given this subject some thought, um, those of us on the innovation side uh, whiffed a number of times. We overpromised, and I am a, 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 um, a participant in this, in between being governor and senator, I spent a while, got very involved in the energy field, raised a clean energy fund, but we overpromised the transformation that was going to come about in changing the energy mix in terms of how quick it would happen and how many jobs it would create. And I think one of the, as a subset, one of the great um, it would be worthy of more academic analysis of how we manage to so dramatically lose the climate change debate in terms of American people's thinking. Secondarily, we you know, the, the long-awaited revolution, innovation revolution that was going to be spurred by life sciences, life sciences and mapping of the genome, uh, you know, just hasn't come to come to uh, place as quickly as hoped. And if anything, I think our lead in life sciences has been retarded by an FDA process that increasingly gets more and more cumbersome. And unfortunately, we are even seeing, and I say this with respect to some folks in this room, when the freaking Europeans can you know, bring a drug to market in half the time and half the cost, <laughs> you know, we're kind of in trouble. And you know, innovation got more and more into a less capital-intensive area around social networking market. And they've been great companies, but it's not this broad-based innovation uh, that we've had. Uh, I will sum up quickly because I know we're going to get to other questions. There are some, and, and then and one other, one other, and why, while reflexively bipartisan, I do need to point out some of the challenges we face, kind of at the macro level of uh, of politics. You know, innovation and federal support for innovation falls in that dreaded category, for the most part, of domestic discretionary spending. And as we grapple with our now close to $16 trillion debt, the only place that we've been cutting so far, a trillion dollars, uh, with the Budget Control Act and other actions, has been within that 14% a federal spend that is domestic discretionary, which is all our R&D, all our education investment, all our infrastructure investment, all our energy investment, all our law enforcement, all our early childhood. You know, and, and my biggest concern, for example, with Congressman Lyons' budget is not some of the, the things he does on Medicare. I don't agree with all of them, but I give him absolute due credit for being willing to break the glass on that. But what scares the hell out of me about his budget is he takes that 14% on domestic discretionary and takes it down to 5%. Tell me what company, country is going to be an innovation leader in the 21st century if they're spending less than 5% on all their education, all their R&D, all their infrastructure, uh, all their energy. It just is not, that's the growth component of our economy. 
and it's a, a, a dramatic step back. The good news, just so this is not all, is not all belief, is we have seen uh, some recent legislative action. Uh, the jobs bill, uh, not by any means perfect. Matter of fact, there are things that, that need correction in the jobs bill. But the jobs bill does, at heart, two things. One, it makes it easier for startup companies to access the capital markets in a less costly manner. With some of the surveys, obviously, uh, uh, changes with uh, a higher thresholds in terms of capital requirements before you hit your reporting requirements. So it, so it does some changes in terms of opening a new avenue for companies on growth. What it, what it also does, um, that I think is potentially very powerful, with the demise of the angel networks and with the the lack of early stage venture capital funding, it opens up and democratizes the ability to fundraise over the internet for early stage companies. And crowdfunding um, has got potentially some problems. It was fascinating to hear the debates inside the Congress when we've had some of the older senators who were, who were, you know, adamantly against this. Uh, and it was kind of less a left right, and it was more a future past. I mean, they were citing, you know, the the boiler room operations that would prey on grandma and grandpa as opposed to thinking of the eBay model that the internet has a remarkable ability to self-police bad actors. There will be some mistakes made. But net-net, being willing to take the chance of seeing if we can get some trusted aggregators using the ability in limited ways to raise capital is, is a great step forward. Where we've got to move to the next level. So Jobs Act, net good, some problems on, on Candidly, on some of the restrictions, some of the restrictions will put too generous in there, and it needed some correction. Um, last point I'll make again, because I'm going on too long, is that you know, capital access, market access, good news. If we're going to also continue to push the innovation agenda and make it more real, um, because while we, as I mentioned, with the budgetary pressures, uh, the actual dollar and cents investment in R&D continues to go down at both the governmental level and, unfortunately, even at the corporate level. Um, one of the things, if we're going to be able to make this case, we have to not only win the capital end of it, but we have to win the talent end of it. And one of the things that Jeremy Moran and I have been working on in our startup app, and Chris Coons and Marco Rubio as well, is saying, you know, it just makes no sense at all to continue to train the world's best and brightest and then send them home. You know, what we have is a national security policy that we would take China's most talented generals and bring them over to West Point and expose them to all of our military theory and all of our best brains, and then send them home? Would that be part of a rational national security policy? Well, it is equally irrational to take the best college and universities in our, in our country, uh, in the STEM fields in particular, where we do not have nearly enough native-born Americans, and train those best and brightest, and then offer virtually no opportunity if they have a job opportunity to stay here. So we create a whole new STEM visa category in our startup bill, uh, that makes sense. We redefine the so-called E5 program, which will, creates a new entrepreneurs category, lowers the threshold to about $100,000 capital raised, uh, about three to five American jobs created. It needs better, it needs better monitoring than the current E5 program. Let me acknowledge that. But it says, if you are best and brightest in the talent global talent contest, and you want to stay here and do it in America, we want you to do it. And if you want to start that startup here in America, we want to do it. And we take one other piece just to stir the pot before I, I close up, um, and realizing there's some academics in the room. We, we start a, and I'm not sure this is a perfect idea, but I sure as heck would like to keep it in the bill to uh, uh, see heads explode, um, <laughs> which is to look at the unfortunately shrinking pie we have of federal research and development dollars and take a small, small percentage of that, 0.15% of 1%, and use that to generate um, research from laboratory into commercial application. And uh, some schools do a halfway decent job of that, many do not. And, and we even touch the unholy grail of saying you know, if a university researcher, after some period of time, still has no support system from that university or from the patent office, uh, do you even at least float out the idea of a free agency uh, for certain uh, universities? Now again, that's pretty radical stuff, but I think, um, and it may or, again, may or may not be a good idea, but I think with, it, with continuing pressure on research dollars, traditional model needs to at least have a fuller debate about how we get ideas 
you know, fully developed in, out and into the marketplace. Long answer. Oh, that, that, that is great. In my role as a, as a journalist, I picked up about 20 different story ideas from what you were saying. And I think you also have, have illustrated ways to make the case for, uh, for a, an innovation policy. Let me ask you about the connection between policy and politics again. You're saying that you're reflexively bipartisan. You mentioned a lot of the Republican partners. You had Senator Moran, Senator Rubio, Senator Corker, et cetera. Most of what we see about the Senate in particular suggests that it's all standoff, it's all filibuster, it's all people at loggerheads and nothing gets through. First question is, are we seeing a misrepresentative version of it? Are we only getting the bad news? Is there more stuff going on? Second is, as you think of successes you've had in bipartisan efforts, what are the lessons we draw that we can extrapolate from successful bipartisan efforts? Great questions. Um, I can't speak to the House. I think it may be wacky no matter who's in control. Um, a, I think there are 75 senators that would vote for a rational, bipartisan deficit reduction plan that had entitlement reform and new revenues. And see if we get that chance near the end of the year and why we have to wait for another catastrophe um, to happen or the edge of the catastrophe is, is more than frustrating. Uh, I am a new guy in the Senate, so I don't have any historical perspective, but if I, the level of kind of unease in the Senate, in both parties, I think is very, very high. And I think you know, we can all uh, appropriately cast slings and arrows at politicians, but they're not totally unaware. We know that 90% of us, 90% of Americans think we're dysfunctional. Um, the challenge is that there are no, there are no institutional supports for people to do the right thing. You, know, you might get a journalist saying a nice thing, you might get a, you know, an added boy from the editorial pages that maybe 2% of Americans now read. Um, you might get a business leader every once in a while saying, you know, that's brave. Uh, but or on our institutional support, zero. I have one of my greatest frustrations, and I am as pro-business a Democrat there as there is. I was endorsed by every major business organization. Um, I pleaded with all the national business organizations, Chamber, NAM, NFIB, uh, BRT, you know, as we approach the debacle of, of the, the debt ceiling, you know, get in the fight. We need you in the fight. You don't have to endorse our specific plan, but Come out with, you know, help be part of a realistic, you cannot do this by just taxing the rich or by just taking a nip and tuck here. It is going to take revenues, it's going to take entitlement reform, and be in this fight and don't just say we want corporate tax reform first. And without exception, we got, on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, attaboy letters. They weren't in the game. And while we politicians deserve 80% of the 80% of the blame uh, for the debacle that we put the country through, and God willing that we won't do it again at the end of the year, the business community, which is the innovators, the drive drivers, did not play in a meaningful way. Uh, when I was governor, we had a similar battle. The only way we got it done, and I had a two-to-one Republican legislature, was we had full-fledged support of the business community to raise taxes and cut back on tax expenditures, some that were even beneficial to the business community. Because the net net and it didn't, you know, didn't hurt Virginia. We got named best managed state in the country. We got named the best state in the country for business. Didn't we, we've got to have that translation take place to reinforce the bipartisan efforts and that the good intentions of senators. You know, one of the things I've often thought that uh, you know, as you see the power of certain large financial interests to, uh, I would argue, in the Republican process, keep um, certain presidential candidates viable long past their expiration date. Um, you know, a, 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 you know, you talk about innovation, it would be very cool to see a hundred million dollar bipartisan super PAC around uh, financial responsibility. You know, something that would reinforce good behavior. Now, where, where is, you know, and, and the problem that has now happened, and part of this, again, I'm going to sound partially partisan here, is particularly the, some of the newer members of the House 
who think there is no such thing as just a regular bill. And consequently, every bill has to become warded on with every social issue and every other issue around. Uh, makes it difficult for what have been in the past relatively non-controversial bills, but they keep the rules of government moving to get through. I mean, it is, again, a little bit pathetic. Uh, we in the Senate were all kind of high-fiving each other uh, because we broadly passed, with 72 votes, a two-year flat-funded transportation bill. <laughs> Two years flat funding for, for a transportation bill. You know, it's not, you know, this is not defeating communism. You know, uh, <laughs> yet in comparison, you know, with a house that doesn't want to do more than a 90 day bill, you know, where's all this concern about predictability? But so, you know, what happens is more and more often, and this is not, you know, this is not a critique of the leadership because the leadership ends up having to take care of their outliers, more and more bills are negotiated simply with the three leaders. You know, Senator McConnell, Senator Reed, Senator uh, Speaker Boehner, and everybody else is kind of left. And even small bills then don't get through. The, the successes um, and frustrations. I mean, uh, Bob Corker and I wrote the first two titles of the Dodd-Frank bill, got 85 votes. And, but for decisions made above our pay grade, you know, there was no reason why Dodd-Frank couldn't have had 75 votes and you would have had 90% of exactly the bill. We could have just made some, um, some tweaks around it. Um, you know, the, the jobs bill that just passed, obviously uh, uh, overwhelmingly um, supportive. Um, some of the things on both, one of the frustrations I have now, and I think probably many here, and I'll, I'll stop after this, is that on both Dodd-Frank and on healthcare, they are both very imperfect vehicles. I'm more familiar, I'm very familiar with both. I think historically, when the Congress has passed a major piece of legislation, and this is not exactly news, but they never get it 100% right, you know, and traditionally you come back two to three years later and you do a fix-it bill, and I have a long list on Dodd-Frank, I don't know that needs to be fixed, but we're now caught in this conundrum where, particularly driven by some of the newer members in the House, you can't fix anything, it's repeal or nothing, which is not a healthy way to govern. Um, so somehow this law jam has to be broken, and I would argue that the, the proxy, whether we like it or not, the proxy for whether we will get innovation right, whether we will get energy right, whether we will get anything right, will be putting in place a broad-based deficit reduction plan because it will, once we break the law jam around entitlements and around revenues, I think other things will be easier, but we've got to get through that first. Thank you. I'll ask you just one more question before uh, involving our, our, our audience. This draws on your experience as a successful governor and a very engaged senator with all the experiences you, you, you've mentioned. Does it make sense, given the problems in federal government policy now that you very eloquently described for people supporting innovation agendas to look more and more to the states and to cities and things? That, that, that's where the arena where things should be fought. What are, what are the pluses and minuses of shifting towards a, a non-federal emphasis? Um, well, the pluses are you can you can get things down and you can use the states and the localities as your uh, laboratories. I'm chairman of an organization now um, called the Alliance to Save Energy, which promotes energy conservation. It should be the lowest hanging fruit, and it is Fortune 500 companies and environmental groups. You know, somehow in the you know, kind of discussion around climate and so forth, even energy conservation has gotten a bad name. And, you know, there's nothing that is un-American about energy conservation. You know, whether you're remote metering or other ways to set, you know, net net save energy, it should be a it should be an energy generator. And so we fought a lot about moving it back down to the these policies to the states to try to get us um, better branded models out there. Um, the challenge, though, is, you know, whether it's state or whether I think about, I spent a lot of time on the foundation world trying to move you know, a number of educational foundations into education reform, did some good work, but to get to scale, you got to get to the federal government at some point, you know, and, and um, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot give up on that, and, um, you know, there are, if we're going to get back to innovation, one of the things that, um, we, could, we can do, and I think this would help us on innovation, 
I didn't re I didn't realize, for example, I, I have a much better understanding now about why some of our national policies are so dysfunctional. Um, you know, why we don't have a rational transportation policy, and a lot of it's due to congressional jurisdiction. Now, I'm brave and courageous and willing to fall on any sword, but you know, nobody talks about rechopping up the committee jurisdictions, and that's the most foreboding of all. But there are other things that we could do. You know, I think the president has put forward a very uh, good idea um, that uh, I've talked to Senator Collins about, I've got to talked to Senator Coburn about, Senator Lieberman and I are co-sponsoring, that would give the president, what all presidents had until President Reagan, the ability to reorganize the federal government in a more rational basis. You know, the note, the note of, uh, you know, I think about, we were talking earlier, uh, you know, the Commerce Department, trade opportunities, you know, we are it's totally mismatched in that area. So, government reorganization is a way to kind of push uh, innovation. I also think we need to show the ability to, to do some duplication elimination and other program elimination as a way to redeploy towards uh, uh, more innovative, more successful programs. And then, and then I think the administration has made some strides in this area, uh, but I am a firm believer that it is not the job killer that it is represented, but I think we need meaningful regulatory reform and a more rational basis to try to change the incentives inside regula regulators. Uh, I've got kind of a regulatory PICO approach so that regulators think at the front end that if they add a new regulation, you not only do a cost benefit, and by the way, you do need some independent cost benefit analysis. You know, nobody believes, either industry or the agencies at this point, that there would have to be some level of offset to a new regulation so that you would realign the incentives inside the agency before they even put the regulation out. So I think if we're going to drive towards innovation, thinking about how we kind of make our government processes um, more, more um, uh, flatter, uh, streamlined, how we think about uh, some of the duplication that can come from government reorganization, again, all helps us then to push the innovation agenda, which unfortunately right now is sometimes retarded by the bureaucratic fights and regulatory hurdles. Thank you. Um, we have a microphone, so yes. And please identify yourself. Sure. Uh, Bryce Bashir with Communications Daily. Yes. Okay, thanks for <coughs> I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts on uh, what Congress should do next on uh, Spectrum. <laughs> well, you know, what I should do next on Spectrum? Well, you know, one of the things would be a really good idea if we actually took a Spectrum inventory and we figured out what was out there and what was actually being used and who was using it. Now, I know there are concerns, uh, you know, from some of our, I'm on the Intel com uh, Committee and there are appropriate, uh, uh, some of our Intel agencies. But we have a lot of spectrum out there that I think is sitting semi-fallow because uh, a lot of government operators do not want to identify their lack of usage of, of this spectrum and their, their uh, husband. Um, I was a big advocate as we moved towards, not successfully, I should add, uh, as we moved towards the D block, and I do believe we needed a public safety spectrum um, that the, I think it could have been more perhaps shared. Uh, and I say this as a somebody who put the put my money where my mouth is and invested more in a single public safety network in Virginia than I think about five hundred billion dollars five hundred million dollars more than virtually any other state. We were cutting edge, uh, but you know if we're going to give public safety this whole new ten megahertz spectrum and a revenue stream, I think they needed to have skin in the game. I would have loved to have gotten a give back from public safety from some of their underutilized spectrum. Uh, and I also think on, you know, I think that the, some of the stuff that was passed in the, 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 the end of the year bill, um, you know, set the framework for some of the broadcast. Quebec, you know, I think they, you know, you got to give them a revenue stream. You got to give them an incentive. And I think we, we put that in place uh, with the legislation passed at the end of the year. Um, uh, but we need to do more. This. You know, the process of, the speed of, of, you know, relocation in terms of the broadcasters, getting the law, getting the, uh, uh, the auctions right, you know, we're talking five, seven years, we ought to see if we can speed that up. But a lot of this ought to be prefaced by, you know, there should be no harm done with a valid inventory of existing users with their actual utilization rates. 
So uh, how about back here? So. I'm uh, John Workman. I'm the Public Policy Director with the Association of American Geographers. I think campaigns are a big opportunity for issues to be talked about, important issues. And I guess my question, Senator, would be, how do we get this innovation consensus, this technology consensus, you know, raised to the forefront during this presidential campaign? I mean, since Rick Santorum dropped out and Mitt Romney became the consensus nominee, the two big issues have been Hillary Rosen and Ted Nugent. Um, so that's sort of unfortunate. I mean, it's totally unfortunate. So how do we get these issues raised? John, great question. Great question. And, um, You know, we need to be able to talk about innovation on one, both a realistic timeline and in a less elite way. We often talk about innovation targeted purely towards you know, not just college degree, but postgraduate degree folks, all these benefits, without acknowledging without acknowledging, you know, the challenges that innovation has brought about. You know, the, the globalization of the marketplace, the ability for money to know new borders. Yeah, it is. I take my state in Virginia, and it costs us a lot of jobs in South Side Virginia. The you know, best day I had as governor was when we were able to bring you know, 300 mid-tech jobs to rural Southwest Virginia, and a kid came up to me and said, you know, before this I thought I'd have to leave my hometown to get a good job. I can, now go to Virginia Tech and come home. You know, we as policymakers need to do a better job around the innovation agenda, showing that this can actually mean jobs coming back to your communities. Uh, I think insourcing is a huge piece. I've got a bipartisan bill with Frank Wolf, Republican from Northern Virginia, that would add actually a small, because federal government does nothing on economic development. We're the only national government in the world that doesn't do anything economic development-wise. Uh, Virginia can beat everybody else's tail, but when I'm competing against South Korea or Mexico and Canada was tougher. They would add a five thousand dollar extra forgivable loan on top of the existing econ local and state economic development. No, not a new whole new program, but would layer on for insourcing of tech and manufacturing jobs coming back in. That could be part of an innovation agenda. I think we have to be realistic on the time frames. Um, you know, I, I've got a daughter who's got juvenile diabetes. She's had it for, uh, you know, now we're at uh, seventeen years, and you know. Everybody gets juvenile diabetes, what they hear from the first JER person is the disease is going to get cured in five years. That five year cure has always been five years more right you now. So we need to be more realistic, whether it's on disease, whether it's on energy transformation, or others. I was wrong. I, I was a you know IT and telecom guy where the transformation took place much quicker. I remember when I got in the, the wireless in the 80s and all the predictions were it was going to take 30 years to build out a wireless network. And at the end of that 30 years, it would be 5% of the people would have cell phones. Thank God they were wrong. Um, but in these other fields, we need to be a little more realistic about the time that transformation will take place in areas like innovation and life sciences. Uh, and again, I'm not being very articulate. I would love to have your help on this. We need to figure out a way how this innovation actually helps people's lives who aren't living in Washington, D.C. or Cambridge, Massachusetts or Austin, Texas. How it helps people, particularly in, in I'm a big, big believer that you know innovation can be one of the most empowering tools and give people the ability to live in rural communities. And we have not done a very good job of our team. So we just have three more minutes before the time we promised Senator he, Senator he could go. Who has the most pressing? I will let you choose who has the most pressing. I'll question. take four. You know, okay, I'll we'll take take four. So I'll try to be brief. So how about um, behind you there? Uh, Senator, we've, we've been here all morning. Uh, Could you say, yeah, uh, identify? Uh, Chris Ball, Office of Naval Research. Nobody's mentioned the military. Uh, we spend a ton of money in the military. We're going to have to keep doing that. We buy things, we build things, we design things, we have people in the process. What, what's your, what are your thoughts on using the military expenditures as a driver for innovation, making them sort of best in class in terms of all the aspects of innovation? Great, great question. And um, obviously, you know, DARPA is Exhibit 1. You know, ERPA hopefully will become Exhibit 2. And great kudos to the military, particularly the Navy, on what they're trying to do around energy efficiency and next generation fuel. Um, and I would also argue uh, I'm on a commission right now that is looking at all of the 
R&D components in the intel community. When we think about the military, you know, the intel community is doing some pretty extraordinary things in figuring out how, you know, this is almost a whole separate subject in your question, but how we can get some of that stuff at an appropriate time and place declassified and out into the marketplace is a, is a um, huge opportunity. The challenge I think we have on the military side, which is, and this is an area that I've got a lot to learn about, how we change your mindset on military procurement to think that it doesn't all have to be invented inside and designed only to your specs. Um, because I'm, you know, I don't know much, but I know enough to be dangerous to know that the, you know, the R and D process in the military is brilliant. The procurement process is less so, <laughs> and the ability to translate that into, to, um, um, you know, commercial apps is is challenging. Maybe we need an Intel type funder on the mil on the mil military side. That would be, I think, a very interesting idea. In, in Intel, by the way, the software we use is a kind of a, basically a venture capital firm that's partially Intel funded that looks at apps that could have a dual use. I think uh, some of that on the military side would be very interesting as well. But I'd love to have. I didn't. I don't. I'm not satisfied with my answer. So if you've got specific ideas on how we can do better, I'd love to hear them. Please offline. So it has time for one more quick question. Sure, sure. So still on here? Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Luck at UVA. Thanks again, sir. Um, one question in three parts. Uh, your perspectives on the BRICS states. You mentioned China earlier. You mentioned India. Um, is it leadership change in Russia? Maybe you'd like to get into that also. Um, your views on the triple witching out in December, um, the, the so called triple witching out, Bush tax cuts, or the tax cuts from the previous administration, sequestration. And um, the third, and this is especially personal, your views on how the Commonwealth is going to play a role, large or small, to what degree, in, uh, in November, um, a possible vice presidential pick, and any governor there. Uh, Quinnipiac has unemployment of 0.7%, so that goes back. Um, all right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, let, me, um, let me do these relatively quickly. Rick, I'm, I'm um, interested in all the countries. I'm actually chair of the U.S. India Caucus. And, um, you know, spent a lot of time in South America, still think that is, from, in, from a, as we move appropriate focus to, to Asia, I still think we kind of ignore, from a business and opportunity standpoint, South America at our peril. And I think the president has, I've got a lot of support for the president, but I think that's one area that been kind of a missed opportunity, and Brazil seems to be on the straightest upward path of any of the four. Um, I was last in India in uh, January, and you know they're having real growing pains. You know, of course, they're you know, they're having apoplexy because they've only got a seven percent growth rate. Uh, but we would love to have a seven percent growth rate. But, but with the number of their population coming into the workforce, if they don't have close to eight. You know, they have enormous unemployment problems, and their government structure is really creaky. The same government at this point, in terms of the promise of what it, and how India felt even three years ago, is, is a really different feel today. Um, China, I think, is experiencing some of the same, as they've got price pressures on their coastal efforts, and, and I think they're going to be very interesting to see their transitions. You know, um, Russia seems to be back to the future. Uh, and you know, it, I still think, with particularly with Russia, um, enormous, enormous opportunities around the innovation area. Still, some of the brightest, if not brightest, minds, particularly on the IT side, uh, that we ought to be doing more partnering with. Um, in terms of of the triple witching hour, you know, it's shame on all of us if we replay the Thelma and Louise movie. You know, if we drive like hell at that cliff and wait to get to the point that the market's got to take a couple thousand point drop or we have a, 
you know, an interest rate spike, remember, even again, if you take one more little factoid array, every 1% increase in interest rates add $1.3 trillion to our debt over a 10-year window. So if we're working like hell to get $5 trillion off of our debt and we have a three-point interest rate spike, 300 basis point interest rate spike, we're back to flat. And so what I'm doing right now is, you know, Bolson sent in perfect, and the six one perfect, but upgrading those. And I do think we're gonna to need to do more on healthcare changes than, than the president has proposed. And I do think we're gonna to need to take both in Medicare, and I think we ought to go ahead and bite the bullet on Social Security since uh, we're now paying out more than we're taking in and postponing the inevitable on that. You know, the bigger the deal, let's do it all at more at once. And, and on the revenue side, um, I think there is a very powerful argument, even though it is only at the, sur the surface, you know, that is being made that, you know, 47% of Americans don't pay any federal income tax at all. Now, they obviously pay other ta taxes, sales tax, uh, gas tax, other things. Um, but I think rather than doing this 250 cutoff on, on the Bush tax cuts, you know, pick your, pick your break line, but, you know, 200%, 250% of poverty, that everybody above that certain or whatever level ought to be paying something into the federal income tax system, even if it's de minimis. Even if it's only $100. I think it makes it much easier to hit people like me at a much higher rate and a more progressive if you can at least deflect this argument that everybody's not paying in something. If this is the national crisis that I believe it is, that Admiral Mullen has said is a greater threat to our economy than Al Qaeda and the terrorists, we have to address it with that level of seriousness. And so the hard policy work of how we put a deficit reduction plan in place that continues to include a growth agenda. You can't just do this by whacking down just with domestic discretion at 5%. That hard work needs to be done now, and I need your help. And we are working on that real time. And um, you know, my hope and prayer would be um, that if there is some group put together, it might actually include people who want to get a deal done. Um, that was an obtuse reference to the super committee. Uh, <laughs> and on um, the last point, you know, uh, as Virginians, um, you know, I think it is, it's great for Virginia, whether you're a supporter of the president or, or a supporter of Obama, supporter of, of Romney, um, you know, that we're gonna be ground zero. Uh, I think we saw, uh, again, this is public information, the number of permutations that it'll take to get the president to 270, there are more paths that run through Virginia uh, than any of the other swing states. So that means uh, for those of us who live, uh, well, actually any of us in the area with the Washington, D.C. market, uh, you know, TV stations are going to be very, very happy this fall. <laughs> and we're going to be pretty upset with the amount of uh, negative advertising. Let me close with this, and, and that is goes back to some of the other questions, and Jim, the question you raised is, you know, how do we get this agenda, which is um, an absolute cornerstone or bedrock of any growth agenda going forward, how do we get this in a rational way into the debate? And not just with the kind of glib um, passing line of, we need to continue to build the best and brightest in America? Uh, how do we get that talent component around immigration into the debate? How do we, you know, I think, take a good hard look at FDA and how we rationalize that so we don't continue to see the offshoring of a lot of that intellectual capital because our process, where we can protect patients, but still do it faster. Uh, I think, you know, and it pains me to say this as a telecom and IT guy, but. I honestly believe there's going to be more jobs and wealth created in the energy sector over the next 25 years than any other sector. And we are incredibly rapidly losing the intellectual capital that we had in area after area. You know, if we were going to be on the depressed side, the fact that, you know, we can't even frickin' reauthorize the Export-Import Bank or a multi-year period when countries the size of Canada, one-tenth of our economy, has got an export support agency that is in the last couple of years has put out two or three times more export support than we have. There's nothing partisan about this, and maybe in a perfect economic world you wouldn't want this, but 
if we're going to try to recognize that 95% of all the new customers for American products are not going to be domestic, but they're going to be foreign, we desperately need to support not just the Boeings, but the small and mid-sized companies selling goods and services abroad. You know, so you need to demand that of us. You need to, you know, Rob Atkinson and, and uh, the other groups here, Technology Policy Institute and Silicon Flatirons and stuff, you know, let's come up with something. Not a 47-page um, position paper, but help us come up with that articulate way that uh, we could force both of these candidates into supporting. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to be one of the messengers, and I'd be more than happy to recruit not only Jerry Moran, but a bunch of other uh, my Republican colleagues to help push this to the forefront. It's essential. Thank you all very much. Thank you.